Welcome uh, to the Development Studies uh, Seminar. Uh, we're very uh, lucky to have uh, Cedric Durand here today to talk about fictitious capital in the 21st century. Um, and he's going to draw on his book, which came out um, from Verso uh, in 2017. I'll just um, introduce Cedric uh, and then Carolina, who will be our discussant, uh, and then we will, uh, as usual, open it out to the floor for uh, questions. So Cedric is an economist and associate professor at Paris 13 University. He teaches development theories at the um, School of Social Sciences and is on the scientific board of the MSA, MSH Paris Nord. Um, working within the tradition of Marxist and French regulationist political economy, he studies globalization, financialization, and contemporary mutations of capitalism. And he's also on the editorial boards of um, uh, the Revue d'Economie Industrielle and on the journal, the online journal Contretemps. Um, and um, just to also introduce um, Carolina. Carolina Alves is a research fellow at the University of Cambridge who specializes in macroeconomics and international political economy with an emphasis on the perspective of global changes in politics, economics, and governance. So we'll first hear from Cedric um, and then Carolina and then uh, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Faisy, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and to talk uh, to you about fictitious capital in the 21st century. So I will draw on the book and make ad some additional comments more related to the current situation, as you will uh, see. So, of course, if there is a need of clarification, something is too technical and so on, just do not hesitate. Make a short point, a question, and I will try my, do my best to clarify it. So I just want to begin with a, an anecdote that was in Paris uh, a few months ago, two months ago. We had a Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon is the CEO of JP Morgan, and JP Morgan is the most successful uh, Wall Street bank nowadays. And he came in the 9393, the, the suburb of Paris, and he came in this region with the idea of bringing some money to support uh, the most uh, deprived uh, population of the Paris uh, surroundings. And so we, he came, he met with Macron afterwards, and so on. And the donation that he made in the name of uh, JP Morgan was 30 million of US dollars. So 30 million of US dollars is very interesting because it's almost nothing in comparison with JP uh, Morgan uh, profits. In fact, that's exactly the money that uh, himself uh, received as a, a wage the previous year. So that's, that's really a small amount of money. But that was symptomatic of something, that 10 years after the great financial crisis, the bankers are back on the, front of the, on the political front, and they are bringing back their uh, own position in order to say that they can help the world, they can help to make the world better, and so on. So in this sense, that was something symptomatic. Of course, this resilience of financialization, that's not the case of bankers coming back to make philanthropy. That's something that is also clear in the data. If you look at stock market capitalization, so that's one of the indicators of financialization. There are many indi uh, indicators of that. But you can look that you had the dot-com crisis in 2001, then a fall, then you have a new wave of financial expansion, then the 2008 crisis, and right now, uh, Stock market capitalization vis-a-vis -vis GDP is higher than it has never been in history. So we, finance has completely recuperated from this point of view since uh, in, in, in the course of the past decade. You also have other symptoms of this persistence of, of uh, financialization. And one of these symptoms is a new wave of emerging market financial crisis. And I think that many of you are interested in this topic. We have seen last year uh, two important crises in Argentina and in uh, the Turkey crisis. Exactly the same kind of financial crisis that we had two decades ago with a lot of hot money coming in from the north and going out very rapidly and letting a population in despair uh, in the meantime. And finally, another uh, symptom of this resilience of financialization is the persistence of a pro-finance agenda. So, here I have two quotes. One is from Phil Angelides. 
that was the chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry uh, Commission in the US Congress. And what he's saying is that uh, right now there is a new wave of financial deregulation. And in fact, Trump is pushing uh, an agenda of uh, uh, financial uh, deregulation, a rollback against the small, uh, small safeguards that were put in place in the aftermath of the crisis. But in Europe too, the same kind of phenomenon is going on. The implementation of the single uh, uh, the, the capital market union is basically oriented toward more uh, uh, an enlargement uh, of the single market based uh, uh, of capital markets. Uh, the key point for, for the European Commission is to improve financial condition by uh, enlarging the possibilities of securitization uh, of uh, loans. So we have a persistence of pro-finance agenda, and that's the first symptom of this uh, financialization. So what I want to take today uh, is to, to, to try to make sense of financialization. That's the topic of the book, and that I will try to give some insight today about that. What do I have in mind when, uh, when I say that I want to make sense of financialization? I think there is two main issues. The first issue is to try to understand the roots of crisis tendency that are linked to this development of finance. And the second issue that we need to discuss is the socio-political socio content of financialization. So on the first topic, I think that there is a problem in the literature about fi uh, financialization. The problem is that we lack a proper theoretical articulation of the link between financial accumulation and real accumulation. And just to give a few examples, for example, in France, we have André Orléans, who is, who is a, 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 an excellent theoretician of money. However, he is not able to, uh, to my view, to uh, correctly articulate the relationship between speculation on the one hand and uh, the fundamental value on the other hand. We have other uh, uh, Another strand of literature with a lot of macroeconomic scholars, post keynesian scholars in particular, that put the emphasis on financialization understood as shareholder value uh, orientation and the lack of investment of non-financial corpora corporation. So I think that's very interesting and very important topic. However, in this perspective, you do not have a proper understanding of what finance is. And finally, you have a Marxist or sociologist literature that puts the emphasis on Swe uh, with the Sweezy, Arigi, and on the sociologist side, Krippner, that consider that there is a turn toward finance of accumulation, accumulation through financial profits. However, this literature, this literature do not explain how it can be sustained, and I think that we need to understand that. So that's the first kind of problem that I want to deal with. So, crisis tendency and the articulation between real accumulation and financial accumulation. The second issue that I would like to deal with is the socio-political content of finance. In fact, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, there has been a huge, tremendous intervention of, of political actors, of the states, of central banks, in order to rescue finance. However, we need to understand precisely what is at stake in terms of socio-political content with these policies. We need to conceptualize that. And uh, so I will, in particular, that's important to understand the current conjunctures. Uh, I'm just coming from Paris, and you know in Paris, the atmosphere is quite interesting. Uh, this past uh, few days, we had something that I really, I was thinking when discussing with my anarchist friend that I will never see again barricade in Paris. Uh, that, that sounds really old school for me. Oh, something, you know, marginal, maybe one day. But here, during several Saturdays, we had barricades every Saturday during hours in the very core of Paris. And that's the kind of legacy of the, of the policies implemented in the post-financial crisis period. So, the structure of my book, of my talk, will be the following one. First, I will discuss the idea of financial instability. Here, I will draw on one of the most relevant theoreticians for this issue, uh, from my point of view, and this is Ayman Minsky. 
So I will try to explain what Emelinski says and show that is, it is very relevant to our topic. However, and that will be my second point, something is missing in Minsky, in Minsky and what is Minsk, missing is uh, the idea of fictitious capital, the concept of finance in itself, not the instability of finance, but the concept of finance in, in itself. And I will draw on the concept of fictitious capital uh, by Marx. Uh, and then I will try to make clear how financial capital, fictitious capital is sustained. And then we will move more to empirical questions, two questions, financialization, so the period of financialization since the 80s, and I will try to suggest a two period, two time periodization of financialization. And then I will go back to the power of finance in general and in concrete in the, this conjuncture. Okay, so the logic of financial instability. This uh, presentation is very uh, basic, but I think very strong. What uh, Ayman Minsky says is that you have always the same simple dynamic of instability in finance. At the beginning of one cycle, there is confidence, there is good assets, so good security that are circulating, and finance is robust. So you are taking some credits, but you are able to pay back your credits, and you are able to pay back your interest. Then you move to speculation. Then you are, just, you are just able to pay back your interest. And then you move to Ponzi finance. And at this moment, everybody is taking debt and using debt to pay its interest and to pay back the principal of the debt. At some point, you have a crash, you have a crisis. <laughs> and this is occurring again and again and again for uh, centuries. However, Minsky is making things a little bit more complicated. What he explains is that the state is stepping in in order to limit the problems resulting from this financial instability. But in doing that, the state is making financial instability bigger. So try to figure out what, what is in this figure. You have a small crisis. Then the, sta the state steps in and manages the crisis. At that moment, you have a new phase of optimism. People are confident in this situation, and you have a new innovation, financial innovation. At that moment, you have a new crisis, but this time it will be a bigger crisis because you have more things at stake. And then you have improved management again, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you have this Minskian financial super cycle. So you see you have good quality of securities at the beginning, small crisis, the state step in, new phase of financial expansion, bigger intervention of the state, and so on. And in fact, that's pretty good in order to understand what is going on in our current time. If you look at what occurred in the US since the 90s, you observe that you have this intervention of the state exactly in reaction of uh, two financial crises. You have uh, first the saving and loan crisis at the end of the, the 80s. Then you have a massive reduction in sh real short-term interest rate. So that's on the left side of the graph, uh, uh, real short-term interest rate. So the central bank diminished the interest rate in order to support the financial sector and lower the cost of debt. Then you have a, rec a phase of expansion in the 90s, brief phase of ex expansion, then the dot-com crisis, and again, you have a new intervention, and this time you have uh, also uh, an important uh, increase in public uh, deficit. Then you have the crisis of 2008, and at this time you have an even bigger intervention at the level of the interest rate and at the level of the public deficit too. So what you see here is that we have three, in this graph, we have three crises, and each time in order to contain the crisis, the state stepped in with even bigger uh, interventions in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy. So excellent, Minsky is excellent. It's very clear, it's very, uh, what he's explaining is very strong, I think, and it's illuminating in order to uh, understand what is occurring, what, what will occur now. We had a financial recuperation, but everybody is feeling is understanding that financial instability is not going uh, away for a long time. So the, the next, what we need to have in mind is how 
will be dealt with the next crisis. And what are the room of maneuver for the next crisis? That's the big question, and I think that Minskian explanation is putting this problem very clearly. However, what is lacking in Minsky from my point of view is a proper understanding of what is going on with finance. What's the concept of finance? And in order to understand that concept more clearly, I think that we need to use this uh, concept of fee tissues capital in order to clarify what financial value is about. So, a small genealogy. Here, in England, at the beginning uh, of the eight, uh, 19th century, even at the, in the late 18th century, you have the first occurrence of the term of fee tissues capital. And basically, the idea is the following one. There is uh, an enlarged circulation of paper money, and this circulation of paper money is seen as a factor of crisis. Why? Because it, it will favor speculation, and in the meantime, it will lead to important disappointment for speculators, but that's not all. It will spread to the whole banking and monetary system, and it will uh, uh, corrupt the morals of the trading part of the community. So the idea at this moment is that paper money is linked to instability and instability to corruption of the monetary and banking system. So fictitious capital is used as a way to uh, criti criticize the, the concept of uh, paper money. However, in the 19th century, there will be, it will be more and more common to talk about fictitious capital and in a wider sense. And Hayek, of course, Hayek is 20th century, but he's using this literature to uh, forge his own concept of fictitious capital. And what he's saying, Hayek, uh, is the following uh, thing. With that, when we think about overinvestment, in fact, it's not an, an excess of investment relative to demand for the ultimate product that is at stake, but that we have too much investment in terms of too much new project. And I will make, try, try to make that clear with this graph. According to Hayek, you have a clear immediate correspondence between financial balances and real balances. So according to Hayek, if you have an increase in credits and you have the same level of consumption, you will have a real imbalance. What is a real imbalance? Is that there will be a launch of new produ productive projects, but the same level of consumption. So some resources will not be here. We, there will be a lack of resources in order to implement these new projects. And this is a very key factor explaining the crisis. The crisis results from a lack of resources to the functioning of the new facilities, the new projects that were launched. Then you need an adjustment or diminishing co uh, consumption or an abandonment of production facilities. So I see it once, once again, uh, in order to, to make that very clear. According to Ajax, the real world and the financial world are one and the same. So if you have, for one economy, if you have more credit, then you have more investment, you will have some trouble because there is not enough resources for that. So you will have or to reduce consumption or to, uh, to abandon some productive project. Financial imbalances led to real imbalances, then crisis. Mark is much more sophisticated than Hayek, much smarter. <laughs> In fact, what Marx is saying is that on the one hand, there is a kind of elasticity of the real economy vis-a-vis -vis the financial sector. And if you have an expansion of the credit system, of course, uh, this, uh, this expansion will not necessarily lead to crisis. It can help to accelerate the development of capitalism. And there is this quote, uh, uh, an, an increase in credit uh, accelerates the material development of the productive forces and the creation of the world market. So basically, new credit helps to launch new projects. In fact, credit, fictitious capital, credit out of nothing, 
in the, in the spirit of Marx, help to overcome the limits of what is available to loans, what, what is the level of saving at one point in time. However, Marx also understands, as Hayek, that at some point that could fill some crisis. There, you could have, you can have some resource constraint uh, in extreme situation. So he said that where the credit system appears as a principal lever of overproduction and excessive speculation in commerce, because here it forces the reproduction process, which is elastic by nature, to its most extreme limit. So what, what, does, what does that mean? That's very clear. You can accelerate growth using fictitious capital, that's fine, but at some point you cannot do that anymore because you don't have enough resources and then you have crisis. So in Marx, fictitious capital is both something that helps to accelerate growth and something that can nurture some crisis. Okay? So that's this idea. You have a dual character of fictitious capital. So I think that I won't go in the detail of uh, uh, this concept, but Marx is very, uh, what is very interesting in Marx is that he's operationalizing the concept. So he looks at specific categories. And basically he said that bank credit uh, uh, above uh, savings, public debt, company bonds, shares, all of these elements are some source of fictitious capital. If you think about that, the fictitiousness is not exactly the same in the various cases. So in some cases, that's fictitious because there is no previous saving. In other cases, that's fictitious because that's an anticipation on future value. There, so there are various dimensions of, of fictitiousness. But in all these dimensions, you have some, uh, some kind of, of fictitiousness. So what is good is that we have not, not only a general concept, fictitious capital, that we will clarify, but we also have some concrete uh, 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 occurrence of this uh, uh, fictitious capital. So let's go back to our time. If you look in high income economy since the 70s, you observed a rise in the various forms of fictitious capital. You had a rise of credit uh, to the private non-financial sector. So that's, uh, if you want, an average of uh, 11 rich countries, that's the black line. And so that's increasing all the time and stabilizing after the crisis. You also have an important credit, uh, rise of credit to the government sector, especially after the crisis. Uh, that's the cost of the crisis. That, that's the intervention of the state in order to save finance. So you have more uh, public debt after that. And you also have, we all know, already know this graph, a recuperation of the stock, uh, stock market, but that come after a very important rise in the 80s and the 90s. So if you want to understand the weight of fictitious capital in our times, you need to, to compile these various categories. And then you have a very nice graph, a very smooth graph. You have a, a tranquil, slow increase in the weight of fictitious capital in our economies. That was about... 150% of GDP at the, the beginning of the 80s, and right now the weight of fictitious capital is about 350% of GDP. So here you can see the empirical relevance of this category. So that's a compilation of these three dimensions. Private debt, uh, non-financial private debt, public debt, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, capital, or stock market capitalization. In fact, that's a very conservative evaluation of the empirical weight of each capital because you have debt within the financial sector and you also have all sophisticated forms of each capital, uh, uh, derivative products and so on. So I just give you one idea about that because we don't have the same kind of, uh, of uh, of statistics, but we had in the 2000s, the last, uh, the, the past 20 years, a huge increase in the weight of uh, uh, OTC derivatives at the world scale, that's international uh, data, and the stabilization after the crisis at this very high level. Okay, let's sum up the concept. We have three elementary forms of fictitious capital, public debt, private debt, stock market capitalization. These three categories have increased very importantly in the 
past three decades. They have, according to Marx, an ambivalent impact on the accumulation. On the one hand, they help to accelerate accumulation and to overcome the limits of investment funding. And here there is a kind of Keynesian twist in Marx. But in the meantime, they feel unsustainable phantasmagorias. And here there is Hayek or Minsky, huh? something that is not sustainable. And fictitious capital have these two effects. However, and I will go back to that, and I think that is very, very important. One of the key contributions to Marx is to stress that fictitious capital is an anticipation of future value. It's capitalizing of, of, on future value. It's capitalizing on uh, future production. And you will see that this dimension of anticipation will be central to our concern about the weight of fictitious capital nowadays. So, how fictitious capital is sustained? So we, we have seen that there is more and more fictitious capital, but there is an issue out of where that, that is coming. The first idea that we, that think that we need to clarify is uh, the status of financial value. The, the basic idea is the following one. There is an autonomy of finance, but this autonomy of finance valuation is only relative to, relative, to uh, real valuation. You have on financial market competing conventions on the price of financial assets. There is a game of speculation, uh, a game of mirror of financial subjectivities. Speculators are looking at each other, making bets, uh, and so on. However, there is a loose necessary relation in finance with the fundamental value. And in fact, if you look at all the financial bubbles, they are always sustained by a real story. You must be able to convince the other people to step in your speculation and in your bubble. You must have a story to tell. You, you had, for example, in the 90s, the new economy of the internet economy. You have the platform economy and the tech nowadays. You had the, the story about uh, um, housing, uh, a penury of houses in the US that, ex that was supposed to explain that there will, won't be a diminution of the value of, of housing and so on. So you have an autonomy of finance, but this autonomy is only relative. Uh, speculation does necessarily refer to valorization through social production, through the real sphere. So, uh, sorry, this slide is in French, but that's just to stress this idea. You have a process of real valorization on the left, where we have work, you have production, you have condition of co consumption, you have the condition of uh, competition. So that's the real sphere. And the, out of this real sphere, you are able to fill some financial income that helps to sustain the financial valuation. And then you have a feedback loop through uh, funding schemes. So you have this two-way uh, uh, relation between fictitious valorization and real valorization, but you have a preeminence of real valorization. So my point is very simple here. You do not have value creation out of finance. Finance do not create value. So, in order to sustain fictitious capital, you need something. You need that financial incomes that were expected are coming. That's the very precise condition of non-crisis. If interest are not paid, if debt are not paid back, if uh, dividends are not paid, then you have a financial crisis. However, whatever the means, that's not important. If you have a, f a, a continuity of financial payment, fictitious capital can be sustained. And that's the, the, the core of the argument. But here you understand that there is a problem because financial profits, if fictitious valuation is not real in itself, financial profits are real. Financial profits are 
uh, are derived out of the real uh, sector, but they are as real as uh, industrial profits. So you need to map this plurality of financial uh, profits. And in fact, that's quite complicated because you have a lot of kind of financial uh, income that help to fill uh, financial profits. Dividends, interest, capital gains, uh, fees, financial fees, and so on. And uh, probably you know Costas Lapavitsas because he's teaching here. And in his book, there is a very good mapping of these various kind of uh, financial profits. So I won't go in the detail of this table, but this table, the idea of this table is very simple. You have a lot of kind of origins of financial profits. However, the so socio-political content of these various kinds of profit is not homogeneous. Think about uh, interest on debt. If you are paying back your student debt, that's a kind of specific contradiction between you and the bank that is not the same as a contradiction between a transnational corporation that has taken out a loan from a bank in order to uh, sustain its internationalization investment abroad. In one case, there is a contradiction between you as a wage earner and your bank, that would be kind of profit upon alienation. And in another case, you will have a contradiction between the bank and, uh, and the transnational. So you have a lot of, that's just an example, but for all these various kinds of income, you have specific uh, form of contradiction. But we can try to make sense of these varieties, to simplify the picture. And I propose this to, ex to try to explain these varieties. You have financial profits. This financial profit may occur out of three main sources. The one is the mainstream story. It's a small story, but that's the story of innovation. Financial, uh, the financial sector is allocating supposedly efficiently capital in the economy, and then is draining some profit out of that, but that's in general beneficial. But that doesn't fit well with what we know of the financial sector that is right now more taking uh, than it is giving to the real economy. So you need two other stories. And the first story is the story of dispossession. It's out of David Harvey, accumulation by, by dispossession. And the idea here is the following one. Financial profit comes, are extracted out of the production sphere. And you have some kind of political profits. For example, when uh, the, the taxes on corporation in, is diminishing, which is the case everywhere since the financial crisis, you, are, you have a, a diminution of the real uh, level of taxation of transnational corporation. This is filling financial profits through dividends. You also have some direct uh, uh, fees on the population. For example, the rise of student debt, the rise of, uh, uh, of uh, financial fees through um, pension funds, and so on. So that's dispossession. And the second kind of origin of financial profits is what I propose to call, after Lenin, parasitism is a capture of ordinary industrial profits. So that just are some profits taken out of uh, domestic firms or just on their, their own profits or through a in more intensive exploitation of labor that is passing directly to the financial sector. But you also have an internationalization that is very important. And you are in development studies and I think that maybe this part should be interesting to you, that the, the, the link between globalization and financialization. This link is very important because we observed in the, sim, in the meantime when we had globalization, we had this financialization. And the connection is probably to, to be found in the organization of global value chains. Uh, global value chains is the way capital is organized at the, at the world scale with small capitals and big capitals and an uneven distribution and profit within this chain. And most of these big capitals are located in the north. And so you have a kind of pump of value through this, along these global value chains up to 
financial market in the north. Are you still with me? <laughs> okay, so I think that we have all the key elements in order to understand what is fixed capital. It's on the one hand something that is feeling <coughs> instability because of the internal dynamic of the financial system. But that's something that is linked to the real economy that is not disconnected to that because at each moment in time it needs some financial income in order to fill and to sustain its valuation. So here you have two main ways. There, there, there are many dimensions of financialization. So I will, of course, not cover all of them. I just want to dig into two direction. The first one is the relationship between non-financial corporation and shareholders' financial markets. That's financialization and this literature on high profits, low investment in the neoliberal period. And then we will move more to the political side of the policies sustaining financialization. So financialization one and two. I don't know to what extent you are aware of this literature of financialization, but you have a lot of fascinating works, and that's still a very, very uh, productive field. But you have some limits in this uh, literature. You have three kind of explanation. The first explanation, you can link it to Jimmy and Levy, the uh, French Marxist scholars, excellent scholars, very uh, consistent in their uh, research for decades. And uh, what uh, they say is that you had in 1979 a coup, a, a monetary coup, with a huge rise in interest rate. And with this huge rise of, of interest rate, what occurred? People that have some capitals, the financial class, was able to increase its income. That was the revenge of the rentier. In the, after war, in the period after the war, you had a strong labor movement, you had a lot of social conquest, and so on. That was not all marvelous, of course, I'm not saying that, but you had this strengthening of labor. And then, at the end of the 70s, you have a, 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 a strong backlash. And one of the key moments in this backlash was this rise of interest rate, with the aim of restoring the position of the owner of capital, the rentier. So that's fine. I think that's, ex that's very important to explain what occurred at the beginning of the 80s. However, nowadays we have a negative interest rate. So you cannot say that the interest rate is the main driver. You need to find another way to explain how finance is still at the, at the center of the current configuration of capitalism. You have another explanation that is this explanation of a turn toward finance in order to accumulate. That's the idea that financial firms, of course, but also non-financial firms, are more and more engaged in financial investment. And that's the argument of Sweezy that explained already in the late 60s, early 70s, that at some point there will be a lack of investment opportunity for big monopoly capital, and then they will shift to finance. However, the problem with this explanation is that you cannot explain in the medium to long run how it is sustained, how it is able to overcome a recurring crisis. And the third perspective is the limits, is the shareholder value perspective. So that's this idea that you have a comeback of the shareholders that took the power within the corporation in the 80s. And they took the power and they were able to extract more profit out of corporation that, than they were, they, they were able before that. <coughs> the problem with this story is also that how do you explain its resilience in the long run? If you are not investing enough, at some point your profits will fall. And what we are observing is that we have a, 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 an important level of profit for decades now. So, my explanation is that, in fact, you don't have financialization in general from the 80s up, up to now. In fact, you have two moments of financialization. 
I have a nice graph, but I'm not sure that it's very clear. What do you think? <laughs> I will try to comment on that, and after that, there is a very simple table. In fact, the first line in the bottom left is the first period, the 80s up to the mid-90s. At that moment, you had this revenge of the Ranchier, huh? and you had a financial turn of accumulation. Why? Because you have a very high interest rate. So what occurred at that moment? Uh, people owning uh, financial income were able to, to improve their own position, and in the meantime, firms were less... Uh, were more uh, interested in investing in financial products and were able to make some financial uh, profit out of that. So that's the first part. That's the part of financialization where high interest rates were the key driver of the process of financialization. But then you had the crisis. You remember I showed you that you had the first saving and loan crisis in the late 80s, then 2001 and so on. And in fact, we still have an hegemony of finance, but its roots are completely different. Right now, the main driver is not high interest rate. You have a very low interest rate for two decades. The main driver is a new configuration of competition and globalization. You have monopoly capital that, that is reorganized at the world scale with transnational corporations that have built new strong position since uh, in the 80s and the 2000s, and they are now protected from competition, and they are able to make a lot of profit without investing. And that's how this financial capital is sustained, from this monopolistic position. So the simple table is this one. You have financialization one and two. In both cases, you have low investment, high distributed profit, high financial income, and stagnant wages. However, in the first case, you had high interest rate, when no, they are very low. And the second, uh, in the first case, you had high level of competition. That was the beginning of globalization, the, some catch up from Asian countries and so on. And right now, you have monopoly in global value chains with some intellectual dimension that I will not discuss here. And it was not the same kind of financialization. In the first time, you had a period of restructuration of global capitalism with an unleash of competition. But right now, you have what I propose to call predation. Faisy, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. That's not exactly enough, but not, not a drama. Not a drama. <laughs> we will manage to do something. So the last idea I want to introduce is the idea of finance in general as power. And the key concept here is the concept of liquidity. This woman is Suzanne de Brunoff. She is one of the most important Marxists in French political economy in the past decades. She died just a few years ago. And she made a lot of work on finance and monetary uh, Marxian political economy. And one of, the, one of her key contributions is to draw on this idea of Marx of fictitious capital as capitalization, as anticipation on the production of future value. And what she says is that fictitious capital is a claim of anticipated valorization. It's, to quote François Chenet, another very important Marxist scholar, is an accumulation of drawing right on wealth that is yet to be produced. However, this is not just an issue of private people making bets on the future. As it goes through the banking and the monetary system, it's in fact a social phenomenon. What is occurring is a social anti-validation. The credit system, backed by the central bank, is backing the bets made by private agents. And in this sense, the owner of fictitious capital, they think that they owe the value, the face value of their assets. And they will fight 
to preserve this face value of the assets. And in this sense, the owner of financial asset will ask the socio that socioeconomic condition of valorization adjust to this anticipation. So the key idea here is the following one. Fictitious capital is value anticipated. But that's not just a bet in the air. That's backed by the banking and the financial sector. And as it is backed by that, there is a social fight in order to preserve this anticipated value. I will try to dig a little bit in the detail with an example. Local example, Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England. He made this remarkable contribution three years ago about the link between finance and climate change. He said that we have a problem because if we take climate change seriously, we need to keep uh, hydrocarb hydrocarbons in the soil. However, if we do that, we have one third of the world capitalization that will dramatically, dramatically diminish because they are or directly linked to uh, oil uh, industry or indirectly linked to them. What that means? That means that financial markets are anticipated that we will not fight against climate change and that they will do every, whatever it takes to preserve that value. And what Mark Carney was saying is that you need to be ready to have a financial crisis in these terms or a financial devaluation of this asset if you want to take seriously uh, climate change. So all the owner of financial assets are fighting for this uh, value anticipated. They are fighting through liquidity. If one single firm, if you have one single firm that is behaving more socially responsibly, uh, responsibly than the other, or if you have one single country that is having more heterodox economics to a very significant extent, what will occur? They will be punished by financial market. What that means that they will be punished? That the owner of financial assets are able to sell these assets and to remove their wealth to other assets that are more profitable. So liquidity is the ability to pick up where it's the more advantageous. This is the source of the power of finance. Finance is so powerful today because it can pick at the world scales where is the best opportunity for it. Liquidity is the ability of uh, finance to discipline productive units centrally. Uh, financial markets are centrally evaluating the opportunity at the world scale. However, liquidity, I am explaining that and I think that it's really convenient, but in the meantime, liquidity is not just this ability of financial market to uh, pick up the best opportunity. Liquidity is also the condition of non-crisis in finance. When you had a crisis, when is it? It's when you do not have liquidity, when you are not able to sell your assets. So when government are explaining that they are fighting in order to maintain liquidity, in order to preserve financial stability, in fact, they are giving an implicit guarantee to the owner of financial assets that the profits that, that, that they are expecting will be delivered. If liquidity is decisive in order to maintain financial stability, and if public authorities are promising that they will maintain financial stability, that means that they are guaranteeing the right to profit to the owner of financial assets. And maybe I can give you one example of that, two examples of that. The first example is the quantitative easing. The quantitative easing, and it has been acknowledged by all research, even by the ECB, its own research, that it has fueled inequality. Why? Because vis -a -vis, with the quantitative easing and the buying of assets, there has been an inflation in the prices of financial assets, and rich people are the owners of most of these financial assets, so they, are, they were the people that benefited the most from this specific policy. And I give you a second example by uh, Adam Tooze uh, that has made a very interesting book about this decade of financial crisis published last year. And he said that there is a kind of ambivalence in this multiplication of stress tests and new way of supervision of the banks. Because as soon as the authorities say that this bank is safe, 
That means that in the case of crisis, the state will come to rescue it. If you say that it is safe, that means that you think the, the state is validating its activity, so it's validating uh, the fact that it will help it in case of crisis. Conclusion. So we need a critical political economy of finance. I tried to give you a sketch of the various dimensions of this kind of uh, research. But the main point is that we need to look at finance beyond the numbers. Fictitious capital is not only a matter of measuring specifically the weight of finance. We have to do that. We need to, to, to map out all the channels. But we need also to understand what is at stake. It's in fact a kind of appropriation of the future, a pre-appropriation of the future, a pre-allocation of forthcoming value creation and political entrenchment via financial stability mandates. So this idea is very the core argument in the book, uh, is that in fact the rise of fictitious capital is a foreclosure of the future. It's a pre-allocation of the future by the owner of financial assets. Financial stability is then financial hegemony. Uh, fictitious capital has ceased to be a dynamic factor. That was the first idea of Marx. It's more and more a dead weight and social reproduction, and it's calling again and again and again the old sovereignty of the state to, to be saved and to squeeze the social body to feed its own profits. So, against financial stability, we need boredom. Yeah. To protect public budget against austerity, to protect social debt, employee incomes, and decarbonize the economy, it is necessary to reduce the balance sheet of financial actor and definancialize social life. So that's creating a much smaller financial system or through debt jubilee, or through inflation. That's reducing the liquidity to protect people and assets from the autonomous movement of finance. So that's capital controls, specific banks. And that's also socialization of financialized social function. In particular, uh, students, uh, the cost of uh, education, but also pension systems, health systems. All of that means that we need to make finance small and monotonous. In fact, we need to make it die of boredom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Cedric. That's excellent. So we will now hear from uh, Carolina for a few minutes. Uh, okay. Um, is it working? Wait a couple of minutes. Yeah, working. If you want to wait, okay. Yep. Sure. Okay. So um, thank you, Faisy, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, is uh, well, Cedric has been working on fictitious capital for a while, and uh, his book is amazing. I, I recommend everybody to read it, because I think when you work with a, a, Mar a Marxist framework, you get a lot of uh, criticism towards, oh, this is just too abstract, and so on. And I think uh, Cedric has uh, been able to give more, you know, to make things more concrete. And that's, um, yeah, we should... Uh, spend time reading his book. But I'm also happy to be here and feel a little bit nostalgic as around uh, two or three years ago I was here helping to organize this seminar as a PhD student. So uh, I'm feeling, um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. So okay, so uh, let's start with what I agree, <laughs> which is easier. I think uh, um, I do agree with uh, Cedric's framework. I think it makes sense. I believe it's very difficult to argue against the idea that we are still, you know, that we are still living on this kind of uh, financial uh, hegemony. I think this is very clear, and it's very difficult as well to argue against all the severe consequences of financial crisis, and also against the idea of inequality, uh, moderate economic growth, and so on. So I think this is all very um, visible. So in this sense, I think uh, Cedric is uh, placing us, is posing us a very interesting question which is why this new configuration of capitalism with this financial uh, hegemony, why is so resilient? So I think this is a key question. 
And um, one point uh, here is that Cedric's argument, uh, he actually has put in forward the idea of how we can move beyond this controlling finance. And uh, the way he's doing that is, is kind of saying, well, maybe we should try to understand what finance is about. Is this deeper attempt to challenge the relations that finance has established with every single sphere or sector of our economy? So this is a very uh, interesting effort. And I think, of course, the, the juicy, the key interesting aspect of all of this is to bring this alternative framework, which is a Marxist framework for the concept of fictitious capital. Uh, and I think this is, this is key, so it's, it's, it's a great work. Uh, so Cedric has a, a very, in a way, concise <laughs> definition of fictitious capital, although it, it didn't look when he was presenting that concise, but it is, he's saying basically, here you go, um, fictitious capital is a capital that represents um, a claim over wealth that is yet to be produced. And um, so in that sense, it's reprodu reproduction and expansion implies, of course, the growing of future production and so on. I'm gonna go back to this, to uh, a sort of a disagreement with that uh, definition, although I do think that's part of the definition uh, in a way. But I think w w the, the, the point that when you look at uh, this category, fictitious capital, of that definition, what we have here is not a so welcoming now nowadays view and framework that places a lot of emphasis on how we understand wealth and creation of value and so on, which is something that uh, Cedric was trying to explain to us as well. And I think this is very, is, uh, is very important because if you look at more traditional economics, just for avoiding say mainstream, we don't have this concern anymore with the creation of value, where value is coming from and so on. So I think uh, fictitious capital has uh, this, it kind of it places that question in the background because what is so special about this category, you have fictitious and you have capital, so what's going on here? And when you're trying to make sense of uh, that category, what you're actually trying to make sense or where you're heading to is to have a very, very clear view of uh, how uh, value and wealth is created here. Uh, but not only, you know, it also demands us to um, see then the link with this uh, kind of capital of production. And I think this is where things get very interesting, and, and Cedric mentioned uh, that during his presentation, but he goes through his book in more detail. The key uh, aspect of this fictitious capital is how it is a capital that it develops uh, its own dynamics. Uh, it, it kind of gets it at life um, and it goes on and on, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's that, it's from that aspect where many of these contradictions and um, between finance and production will emerge, you come from. And, and, and that's interesting because at the theoretical level, this is also this endless debate about uh, the difference between fictitious capital and interest bearing capital. I'm not going to go there because uh, I almost wasn't able to finish my PhD, trying to understand <laughs> that. Uh, but I think here, the difficulty as well is a difficulty that is in Marx. Marx is also wondering about this different kind of accumulation, the fictitious accumulation, the real accumulation, when you're dealing with, which kind of accumulation you're dealing here and how they are linked to each other. So it's not just us that we're struggling to understand him. He also, he, Marx was also wondering, okay, when, how we can understand that. And uh, so we, at that moment is when you come across with so many different kind of capitals, the money dealing capital, interest bearing capital, the fictitious capital. But I think there's one point, and I do like being fine stake here, is how we look at production as a whole and how actually the, uh, the accumulation itself keeps going regardless of what's happening to fictitious capital. And, and the, another key point here is how fictitious capital is able to carry on extracting surplus value, kind of attaching itself in, in, in this kind of uh, secret of capital. So in, the, in that sense, reproduction carry on, uh, ex extraction of surplus carry on, and I think carry, carries on, and I think that's my, the, the bit, I don't think we disagree on that, but maybe it's just a matter of emphasis. I think from that perspective, it's not just fictitious capital, it's not this capital that represents claim, claim sorry, <laughs> over wealth that's had to be produced, it's also about this movement of capital where you get um, uh, a moment where uh, 
the, because of institutions and regulations, or most like deregulation, we have this uh, facility to transform any kind of a stream of income into these tradable assets, which then can be traded. I think we should see cap fictitious capital as all this process, because I've been thinking uh, more about that recently. Uh, an example that's very easy to, to grasp what I'm trying to say is like the, the mortgage kind of aspect. It goes back to the 2007-8 crisis. I mean, the mortgage uh, lending is, per se is not itself, um, from our perspective, the, the fictitious uh, capital, but it's how actually then this uh, lending and borrowing relationship becomes uh, tradable assets and then uh, what happens to that. And I think this is important. I've been working with government bonds and fictitious capital in Brazil, and once I was uh, giving a presentation, and it gets a moment in Brazil, especially in the middle of 2000s, where the, the public debt is actually uh, uh, decreasing, and someone in the audience is like, oh, so this is definancialization. This is the leverage, and I think, I was like, no, 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 it's not that what I'm trying to say. So I think it's important to kind of uh, uh, move uh, a little bit uh, away from this idea <laughs> that debt, you know, the debt per se can be fictitious capital. So I think this is my main disagreement, and just one extra minute is that uh, if you if you are able to clarify that a little bit more, we're going to head to a situation where, and I think that perspective, uh, Cedric, doesn't disagree with me, is that, yes, fictitious capital is useful for the banking credit system in terms of this lending and borrowing relationship, but it's also this contradiction that it carries when it, you have this process of securitization and so on. And from that perspective, fictitious capital is the link between crisis, between production and finance, but also the, the, the explanation of financial crisis is when you get where you get instability, uh, and is part of the explanation of uh, growth and so on. So I'm gonna uh, sum up here that uh, you know financialization for me, the idea why financialization has been theorized by a more critical uh, political economy literature or in economics is because it's not just the finance per se, it's not the increasing of finance like you get the Epstein approach, oh, you know, more financial transaction. I think it's about actually the contradiction that comes with this increasing of uh, financial motives. And that contradiction you're just able to grasp if you have such a category. And from that perspective, I do agree with your point on Minsk. Mm. Okay, that's it. Wait. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carolina. Um, okay, questions, comments, contributions. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, actually, wait for the mic. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I just have a question because although the capital is fictitious, the sort of innovations and the products of investment aren't. And since the 1980s, I mean, like you say, globalization has heavily um, has been a, in parallel uh, acceleration as financialization and it has also created certain material products which are not fictitious. So how, how do we face the fact that definancialization also has to be followed by actually a sort of very proactive attitude to the effects of the innovation which, I mean, namely um, plastic, for example, or uh, technolo technologically the amount of e-waste we have, how do we face that and face the fact that we need to de-financialize? De how? How? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. You're taking four, three, four, yeah, five. Fine. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And, and you tell me if I put something yeah. after. Yeah. Um, so I think I sort of have two points which I want to discuss. First of all, I, I'd just like some clarity about how this idea of financialization differs from reification. Uh, what's the relationship? What are we talking about there? And then secondly, in terms of uh, praxis, in terms of actual politics, then how, how do we then begin to bridge the gap if we're talking about the differences between the, the financial processes and the political processes? Because it seems the further away you move into the, this, this meta, meta finance processes, the, the further away you move from labor and the claims they can make on in terms of the politics of how that should, whether it should be regulated, how it should be regulated, for what, and in whose interest it should be regulated. Sorry. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for coming.
Um, so I guess I wanted a little bit of clarification on your definition of fictitious capital to the extent that when I hear a claim on future value creation or something on the lines of that, that sounds very similar to essentially how I conceive of other forms of capital. So if you want to call it investment, for example, capital in the form of, you know, a a robot or something or, or some form of automation is also a claim on future value creation by that by that asset. I mean, if you think about asset in terms of its like core, like mainstream accounting definition is a claim on future value. So I was wondering how that differs from the other forms of, of capital. I'm sure we're gonna be getting more. Yes. Yeah, I thought that last point was a good question. Um, I, I wanted in a sense to go also to go back to, related to that, to go back to your reference to de Brunhoff um, and the question of bank credit and fictitious capital and whether or not you include bank credit within the category of fictitious capital. When you put your, one of your slides up, you had bank credit there, but when you talked about the three essential forms of fictitious capital, you actually excluded bank credit, I think that's right, or where well, you were talking primarily about uh, bonds, private debt, in the form of bonds, I thought. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I got that wrong. In, in any event, it goes back to Carolina's point in a way, which is that if you just have your, that very general definition of fictitious capital as anticipating future value creation, then you would include bank credit. But if, on the other hand, you want to emphasise, as I think Marx did, the fact that there are Tradable, security, tradable securities is fundamental to the concept. Um, so bonds and shares, yeah, and securities generally are essential. Then you wouldn't include bank credit. At least that's how I've seen it. But um, I'd be interested in your views on that. Great. Um, should we take those two first? Maybe I, I try that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these questions, Carolina, for your comments, <laughs> nice comments. Uh, so maybe just to, to, I will take in the reverse order, maybe. So uh, bank credit, according to me, is included in fixed capital. Bank credit above savings. So in fact, in Mark's time, th there was a small part of bank credit about savings. But right now that we are in a purely monetary system where money is purely uh, based on the legitimacy given by the state and by the central banks, all the credit system is based on nothing about political uh, trust. So from this point of view, the whole process of creating uh, man money through credits is a kind of anticipation of future value. And maybe I will clarify uh, your, your point on that. In fact, when you have a book value of a firm, you have the value of the, the machinery, you have the value of the uh, buildings, and so on. But that's not the financial value of the firm on the uh, capital market. And the difference between these two dimensions is, the, uh, is this process of capitalization of future profits. In the, mean, in the same way, when a firm is buying new machinery with bank credit, the bank is making a loan, but it's also the interest is relative to the ability of the firm to pay the interest depends on the ability of the firm to make profit in the future. So you have also this anticipation in both cases. So I think that the real, the real unifying concept of fictitiousness is the fact that it's capital that it's not here, that it's to, be, to come. And in Marx's term, that's very clear, because he said that you can, it's fictitious because it cannot be two things in the meantime. For example, if you have a share, a share is a representation in part of a machinery of the firm plus the future profits. But the machinery is here, and the profits are not here, and the share is traded separately of these two phenomena. So it's kind of double accounting. In the same way, if you have a loan, the bank is counting on that money to be repaid future, in the future. But the enterprise is using that 
capital right now uh, in order to develop its uh, activity. So in this process, you have this, uh, you mentioned this idea of unfolding, separating multiple uh, uh, layers. But this multiple, multiple layering is, of course, very present in the complex financial products of today. But it's already here in the most basic forms of banks over savings, uh, that uh, loans over savings, that you have already this dedoubling of the fact that the bank is counting on receiving its money back and the, the, the enterprises or the household using the money at, at that moment. So at least I use that in this way. And that's also very important, I think, politically. Uh, that's the reason why I put the emphasis on that. So in terms of politics, um, that, uh, yes. So in terms of politics, that the question of the problem that we have with uh, financial issues is that it's far away from the point of production. And in fact, that's also a problem that we have in France right now with the Mouvement des Gilets Jaunes. Because the Yellow Jackets right now are fighting very far away from the point of production. And they're asking some forms of social justice and so on, but one of their key uh, claim is that they want fiscal justice, so uh, justice in terms of taxation. And who were the, the forces that benefited the most from Macron action, actions in the past two years? That's corporations that have seen a huge decrease in their taxes. So you see that here we have this connection between financial profits, taxation, and political contradiction. That's not at the point of production. But that's still issues that are some kind of class issues mediated through the state. And I think that was also one of the strengths of Harvey's point about uh, um, accumulation by disposition. Is that, in fact, strategy of profit makings rely to some extent, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, rely on the, what is going on at the point of production. But in our complex society, there is a lot of institutional uh, 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 pass between these two moments of financial appropriation and production of value at the point of production. And one of them is the action of the state. Um, excellent question about, uh, in fact, something is occurring on the real side. You have a huge accumulation of financial profit in the northern country, but of course, you have globalization and a lot of new operations. And I think that you're perfectly right. That's why in the book, I. I in the last part of the book, I developed this part more concretely, uh, stressing the fact that a large part of this fictitious capital is based on position taken in the southern country that make allow transnational firms to anticipate future flow of, of, of income. And don't, don't forget that fictitious don't mean that is completely uh, out of any empirical uh, validation. In Marx, there is this idea that the fictitiousness is linked to a bet on the future. Uh, and in fact, this is the kind of process that is occurring when you are making uh, FDI in the southern country. You are betting on future flow of income that will go back to the north. So that's part of the phenomenon. But this phenomenon of globalization governed by the north, sustaining financial profit and then financialization, is part of the story. But it's not all the story. You have seen the huge rise in features capital that I have explained. So here you have this endogenous process. And that explains why the state needs to step in to maintain this kind of, uh, this level of, uh, of features valuation. Did I forget some, somebody? No. No. I yeah, there is this idea of, but I think I completely agree with your comment on that, Carolina, on the, the fact that part of the, the process of um, the, the rise of futures capital is also a problem for accumulation because it's, it's fostering crisis. On the one hand, it's caused by crisis or insufficient accumulation, but on the other hand, by itself, is, it is going bigger and bigger, fostering instability, and then hurting uh, the ability of the product system to expand. But I think I, we agree on this yeah, okay. point. Right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, we have a, a hand there at the back, Alfredo. Um, thanks very much, Cedric. I thought it was an absolutely excellent uh, presentation. Um, I would like to push you a little bit more on the um, political um, uh, 
transcendence of financialization as the core of neoliberalism uh, and as a process that has transformed modalities of social reproduction and you gave a number of examples uh, as well. But in doing this, in changing forms of social reproduction, in changing the ways of production itself, it has affected uh, social groups in very different ways that don't map uh, in a simple manner to class. So how do you mobilize against financialization with what in mind as what comes after, what to fight for, without falling into populism, since financialization itself doesn't map into a clear class political set of alliances that you can uh, immediately uh, apply for in order to press. I'm trying to, I'm struggling here with, with, with the words, but I think you get the sense, right? What do you do next in terms of both mobilization and alternative projects? Very simple question. <laughs> um, <laughs> process, so where, Thanks, Alfredo. Sorry, the impersonal process is, so where do you start to make political claims? Where is the platform? Okay, uh, yep, you over there. Thank you so much, and thank you for the uh, question of Alfredo, because um, I was wondering about financialization as well, and I would like to go a step before, because I didn't really understand your analysis of the mechanism. And as Alfredo, I think, correctly said, is we cannot homogenize the classes of all fictitious interests into this one claim um, of what kind of interest they have. So I was wondering in your analysis, which parts of, so when you break it down to these like four interests of uh, bank credit and public debt and companies and shares and stuff, I felt that when you said, you know, there were high interest rates um, and then out, out of a sudden there are no high interest rates anymore and it either gets replaced by another claim of how fictitious capital reproduces itself, is it really fruitful to assume this homogenous interest among all the classes, like the class of fictitious capital, or can we not gain insights by splitting it up and understanding even conflicts among these groups um, to understand how the mechanism actually um, resolves? Okay, um, at the back there. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for a very thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, I have two questions, and I don't know your work so well, so I hope I don't stray too far from your core theses. But one is about macroprudentialism and the fact that the global governing community has now kind of endogenized Minsky's ideas. They very much rely on his insights now. Do you see that as having any potential to lessen these future increasing cycles of boom and bust, or are they completely inconsequential? The other is about the spread of financialization down in the classes, class system of society. So we're seeing that increasingly ordinary people are investing in financial markets and becoming creditors. Does that have any potential to alter the dynamics of this, or is it a small phenomenon at the fringes of this? Thank you. And then here. No, uh, behind you. Right, right. Uh, just wait for the mic. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think I w uh, my question is perhaps much more basic in that sense. Uh, you talked about the gap between financial accumulation and real accumulation. You talked about the gap between the finance and you know real struggles, related things, and also about scholars who talk about the autonomy of finance and so on. I was just wondering, where does that leave us with Marx's labor theory of value? And does this really affect everything that you say? Does it need revisiting? What is your comment on that? OK, thanks. Was there a hand here? Did you have a hand up? Yeah. Maybe the test has already been asked, what I'm asking again, but I put it into different terms. The um, legitimacy or the legality of private property to be applied to finance capital, I wouldn't take for granted. And uh, I think this is 
a form of private property for which the legal systems were not made. The idea of private property when it emerged in the course of human history in the previous centuries did not imply this form of property. Yeah. That's a lot. Do you want to, to answer those first? One more. One, one more. Okay. Yeah. But short, really, really short, I guess, but uh, because I'm, I mean, I appreciated your presentation and, and, and really like clarification at this point, which is the, the coming back to Peter's, Peter's point on, on, on bank uh, credit and bonds. And the, so you, you went, uh, meant, you, in your, your response, you went around uh, looking at future valorization. But what about collateral? So basically, the key difference, I would say, is that in the case of bank credit, you have a collateral. So, so they don't really believe in future, like, they don't care about future valorization mm -hmm. while rather they trust on collateral. So that will be the big difference with bonds. Well, you, maybe you see that's not relevant. And I don't know, that would be the question. Now just to begin by this last question, I think the collateral is exactly this issue of dedoubling. So the bank considers that it has the collateral in case it needs it, so it can use in its accounting and building its project as it was, as it fit its capital. And in the meantime, the, the, the person that took the loan is using <coughs> that loan to de and that collateral to develop its own uh, project. So this idea of dedoubling, that is very key. In, in, that's another way to, 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 to stress this uh, overlaying of futures capital is already present, I think, in a simple loan with collateral, in my view. So reverse order again. Uh, private property, excellent point. William Bitter. Uh, William Bitter, that he was, uh, is right now uh, chief economist at Citibank. In September 2008, just after the, the, the state uh, stepped in to save uh, the insurer AEG, made a comment in the Financial Times saying that, well, I was considering that the financial sector was responsible, but if it's not responsible and he's not able to pay for his own error, there is no point of having private property of financial institution. So your point is exactly that. Because in fact, right now, we have private profits over finance, but these institutions are implicitly backed by the state. And I didn't have the time to develop completely this idea of blackmailing through liquidity. But if financial institutions are able to blackmail the states, and all of us, to, to gain some support, it's because they are providing indispensable services to our complex societies. They are uh, uh, allowing pay the, the, the integrity of the payment system, they are uh, allowing the funding of uh, ordinary activities, and when they stop, when they fail, everybody is suffering from that, and we, you have a huge crisis. So that's the reason why they are backed by the state, and that's right that the state is backing uh, this financial function. The scandal is the fact that it's, uh, it's backing these public utilities and guaranteeing their profits. So, so your point is very important, and I think that this moment of the crisis was a very important moment. Because this was in debate. Reading that by Twitter in the Financial Times was not something that was not important. That was one of the options after the crisis to socialize part, big part of the financial systems. And there has been a choice that was not this one. And in the, in the book by Adam Tooze, you have a very good quote from Obama where he explained very clearly that, well, in the US, we want a private banking system, end of the debate. In fact, if that's not, uh, because we are not a socialist country and so on. But there, there is a, a kind of uh, intellectual inconsistency here, and we have to stress that, and we have to be prepared for the next crisis to make this argument. Mark theory of value. So, difficult question. You agree? <laughs> so, a lot of debate, and I'm not an expert in this debate. Uh, in fact, I like the way. Uh, um, Ricardo Villafiore phrased it in the sense that, in fact, you have very various meaning in the in the in Marx value theory, and in fact, you already have some value at the level of abstract labor in the uh, labor process at the moment of realization, but also in the credit system in anticipation of all that. 
Of course, at the end of the day, you have human activities and nature at the root, of, but I will not make any calculation to sustain my point based on uh, Marx labor theory of value. In fact, I think that's very used to, to point out where is the articulation of the various sphere, the monetary sphere, the financial sphere, the, the demon regime, the production moment, and so on. So you need this theory in order to organize this various sphere, but to make some math out of that, I think it's, I don't see how we can do that. But I'm really not an expert into that, and I don't want to, to make too big claims. Uh, so that's for me kind of regulating ideas. That helps me to organize my thinking and my theoretical development, but not the um, empirical stuff. Um, Minsky and ordinary people. So yes, uh, financialization of everyday life means that we are embedded in financial uh, relations, uh, all of us, through uh, pension schemes, through uh, student debt loans, uh, through and so on. And in fact, the same people are, can be divided. On the one hand, they are interested in receiving uh, in high fi level of financial valuation in order to receive their pensions. And David Array, for example, told me that he was very uh, against uh, debt jubilee, public debt jubilee, because his own pension fund will be hurt by that, and uh, he was not ready for that. So you see that uh, the debate can be uh, uh, even among Marxist uh, people. Uh, so I understand this point. That's why, when, in my conclusion, I stress that when we think about definancialization, we need to stress in the meantime, the need to rebuild non-financial way of dealing with financial social function. And in France, for us, that's maybe more clear uh, than in the US because the pension system, is, the most of the pension system is public and is not linked to pension funds. So basically, I'm paying the pension of people that are pensioners today. I'm not making any kind of uh, savings for later. And this is a way not financialized, because it's in real time, of linking the various uh, generations. And I think that's an example of how you can deal non-financially with a social function that is taken into account by finance today. But that's a problem for sure. Politically, we need to articulate that, and people will be uh, worried about that. And the Minsky, uh, Minsky completely accepted by the mainstream and uh, global governance system. In fact, that's only part of Minsky, because you're right, they buy the financial, uh, the financial cycle, it's completely mainstream right on. I think that intellectually that's an improvement, that there has been some kind of progress. However, Minsky was very aware of the need to regulate finance and to make it more small. And this part of Minsky has not been uh, uh, co-opted by the mainstream. So there is a kind of instrumentalization of uh, Minsky that Maria Ivanova, did, she's in London, and she made this point very clearly in a paper, I think in a, uh, I don't remember, in the Economy and Society, I think about Minsky, the use of Minsky in the current crisis, and she, and she perfectly right, there is an instrumentalization of Minsky, but that's only part of Minsky. And, and Minsky is still, I, I think, brilliant thinker and useful thinker for us. Um, yes, homogenization of financial actors, are they different? Or do we need to, to stress the homogeneity of financial claim over financial profits? Or do we have to stress the various sectors in finance? I think my first movement was to unify them. Why? Because they have an instrument to make everything comparable. That's financial markets. Through financial markets, you are comparing risk and, and rewards among a lot of class of assets. You are comparing uh, bonds in developing countries with uh, capital risk in one sector, with insurance in another one, and so on. So I think that it's fair to stress that there is this moment of centralization. And in fact, that's Francois Chenet is making this point very strongly, and I think he's right, stressing the fact that finance is the centralization of the power of capital because you are comparing everything. 
in one instant, in one place. However, I agree with you that there are some contradictions. And in particular, with this very low level of interest rate, uh, insurance companies are suffering a lot. Because when you have low level of insurance, you need to have a lot of reserves as an insurance in order to be prepared to, to cover future risk. So uh, insurers were against this policy of low level of interest rate, while in the meantime, in order to, to preserve financial stability, uh, funds were more in favor of this uh, policy of interest rate. So you, you're right, there are some tensions. Um, maybe we need to stress that more. I, 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 I take your point. And there was this slight uh, late question about um, the political subject in face of finance. So in fact, in France, we had a political subject on the left unified against finance for 20 years. That's the association ATTAC. That's an association against uh, for taxation of finance and uh, solidarity, basically. And it's very clearly on the left and articulated with a lot of uh, social movements, labor movement, climate movement, and so on. So on the political uh, sphere, it plays very well in France because it's making the link between these various movements and the issue of finance. And asking, for example, they were recently they, they made some uh, action against the banks about, uh, about investment in fossil fuels. They also made some action against uh, Google's about issue of taxation and so on. So you can organize that. You can have some, this kind of organization. But I agree with you that's not a mass movement. That's not the same thing as a trade union. That's not an immediate solution for the future. That's a more intermediate step in terms of political articulation. What I will say is that, in fact, there is many ways to be an anti-capitalist today. There are many contradictions of, uh, of capitalism. And you may, of course, there is exploitation on the labor front that is crucial. But when you are dispossessed of your futures uh, as a pensioner because there is a financial crisis and your pension finally will be lowered, you are in, in fight in a, in a position of fighting against capitalism from your position of pensioner. And when you are, I don't know, suffering from a, uh, pollution in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in an area due to the activity of a transnational corporation, you are, in fact, in a contradiction with the dynamic of capital accumulation by private ownership, but you are not on the point of production. So I think that we need to assume, we have to assume this plurality of exposure to the uh, negative impacts of capitalism and the political, uh, building political actors around surrounding these various fronts. I don't think that there is, that nowadays it will be possible to have a, a, an homogeneous subject as we used to have. But I'm ready to be convinced otherwise, <laughs> really. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Can you speak up? Oh, sorry. Could, could there be fictitious human capital in the sense that uh, you, you, there is over investment in higher education by uh, private uh, private actors in the, in the hope of a private rate of return, as well as the society also or the state also invest in, uh, in, in, in the hope of social rate of but in, in, in actual practice most of them will be underemployed, suppose, underemployed, and, and the, 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 the rate of return, both private and social, are, 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 haven't come back. So how, what part of uh, fictitious capital is actually fictitious human capital because there is quite a lot of investment in, in human capital, especially in uh, in Asia, for example, and the second second part is also is that how much of is that fictitious human capital? If there is overinvestment in education, in the hope of migrating to to, to, to a greener pasture, that means in the to the first world countries, etc. 
uh, in the hope of, of getting getting uh, um, appropriate rate of return um, in, 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 the, in the private domain, but actually that doesn't happen, which 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 this neoliberal um, migration specialists call as brain game, that only 10% will migrate, but 90% are staying means, staying means that's a brain game. Whereas I would think that you know if 90% are frustrated that they <coughs> could not uh, migrate for, for, for what they have studied, that means it's actually fictitious, uh, fictitious human capital. I mean, Thanks. Does, does it make sense? Okay. Um, if there's any last question, yep, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll sum up. Yeah. Uh, okay, no, go ahead. No, both, yeah, go. Sorry. quick. You, you, there's the mic there. Yeah. You're quoting to um, referring to. Um, Can you speak up? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, banks having, if they've passed their stress test, but if there's in fact a crisis and they go bank, uh, go. Uh, they, there's a crisis and they're in trouble, then the state has to help them out. As I understood it, and I may be completely confused on this, and you may have to correct me on this, as I understood it, the banks themselves did their own stress test. It wasn't the central bank because they haven't got the resources. Have I misunderstood something? I thought it was not the central banks that did the stress test, the banks did their own. So could you put me right on that, please? Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, and then finally, over there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was really interesting, and, and uh, I learned a lot from it. I'm not an expert in you know the literature on financialization, but I've um, I found very interesting distinction you made between like the first the rentier, the, the the return of the rentier, the kind of earlier cycle, and then the current cycle. And the lady on the panel also touched on the difference between interest bearing and non interest bearing capital, um, <clears throat> and I think. If you look at the asset classes that are being invested in, it's, it's quite different whether you're investing in a bond, because if you're investing in a bond, you're technically lending money, uh, than investing in the stock market. And I think the recent cycle of like stock market capitalization is driven clearly by low interest rates, i.e. leveraging. So I'm wondering, um, maybe I could just benefit, or we could all benefit from short elaboration on whether in your anal analysis you you look into the different asset classes, what's the difference? Or in other words, is a distinction between fictitious and non-fictitious capital based on what the money is invested in? Like where is it, does it become fictitious capital at the source, i.e. bank lending, or does it become fictitious based on what I invested in? Oh, and comments. She already said, <laughs> it's your day. <laughs> okay. uh, so I begin by this last question. Um, in fact, I had a slide with the various dimensions of fictitiousness in Marx. Because when he's talking about fictitious capital, there is not one meaning in fictitiousness. Or it is fictitious because it has not been accumulated previously. It's cre created out of thin air by the banking sector. How it is fictitious because you give value through shares that is not a value that is already here. That's an anticipation on the future stream of value. So in this case, the fictitiousness is related to the fact that it's not here and it's an anticipation. So you have this or fictitiousness out of the origin. It's not coming out of the accumulation process or fictitiousness uh, in relation to the future. But you have also fictitiousness in the public debt, because he considers public debt to be fictitious capital. Why? Because it's not invested in the accumulation process. And, and so it's something, uh, it's a kind of accumulation, because you will receive uh, um, an interest on that debt. However, it's not a, a debt that is invested in the accumulation process. So you have various dimensions of fictitiousness. It took me some time to disentangle that, and that's the reason why I have this table to try to figure out where is the fictitiousness for the various classes of assets. Um, the, the, your question is not naive at all. It's a very, it's a very important question. In fact, stress test, there is a, a very more than ever uh, collusion between the private sector and the regulators. 
because it's very complicated. The, the financial products are extremely complicated, and by themselves, the regulators struggle to understand what's going on. So you're right. When, there is, when stress tests are, are made, there is a kind of negotiation between the regulators and people in the bank. And they negotiate what will be the stress test. But my point is that once they agreed on something, on one specific kind of stress test, it's in fact a political agreement. And when they have said, made this political agreement, they run the, st the, the stress test, and when it is run, there is a result. If it's positive, that means that the, the state will come to rescue the bank afterwards. Are you saying the diplomatic way of the um, bank? <coughs> yeah. Right. Um, and the first question about uh, human fictitious capital. I'm not sure I, I'm, I will go very too far in this direction because I, I need to think about that. But you made one uh, important point is, in fact, Public de uh, student debt is kind of human fictitious capital. There is an investment in education, and when you have higher unemployment than expected or lower wages than expected, you have a high rate of delinquencies on this uh, debt, and so that's a kind of devaluation of this of this capital. Okay, thanks. Um, let's uh, thank Cedric and Carolina. Thank you both. Thank you. Everyone is welcome to a reception.